Welcome to the NHL Weekly Show on the Grueling Truth Sports Network. I'm your host for the NHL Weekly Show, Mike Goodpaster. And right now I'd like to welcome in my co-host, who is the beat writer for the NHL for the gruelingtruth.com. Help me welcome to the show, Sam McGinnis. How you doing, Sam? I'm doing good. How are you? Oh, I, I, I would say I can't complain, but i got to put a dollhouse together later today for my granddaughter. So, as you already noticed, that bothers me. Yes, yes it does. See, me and my wife always had a rule. We never buy anything that I have to put together. And... <laughs> You know, now, if you look at her Facebook post today, she admitted it. I was right because we had all kind of stuff to put together for the grandkids. <laughs> and now she's realizing I was right. <laughs> yeah, I don't like Ikea things together either. So it's just, yeah. Yeah, at least there's a YouTube video I can watch. And thank you to that man who made that YouTube video. So, all right, let's go ahead. Let's talk a little hockey. And last week, we talked about teams that had overachieved or underachieved. This week, let's look at the teams that have done the opposite. They've overachieved, Sam. And I know you get three teams that stand out to you. Yeah, yeah. They're, these teams are the ones that really set themselves apart, especially with being able to contend for Stanley Cups, especially when people think they can't. Because if you can overachieve, it's just like the whole parody thing we were talking about last week. Usually the teams that are lower that beat the teams that are higher are the overachievers. And I'm going to have to start this one with the New York Islanders. And this story started last year when the Washington Capitals coach came over to the Islanders and really set them apart. And now you have backup goaltenders from last year starting this year who are doing good. Their defense is good. And th what they've done is, is that even though their offense isn't fantastic, they've been able to consistently win games because when they need the goals, they get them. So as for an overall overachieving team, even though they're in second place in their division, they've overachieved to get there. So it's very good on their part to be doing all of that. Yeah, and I would think with the experience that they gained last year in the playoffs, it makes them even that more dangerous this year. Yeah, I mean – they did very well against the Penguins. Now they got swept by the Hurricanes, but they even learned a lot from that experience. So they, we may see a rematch of that same series in the first round coming this year. So that'll be definitely one everybody's going to want to tune into. All right. Who else you got, Sam? Uh, number two, I've got the Colorado Avalanche. Now this, yes, they have a ton of talent, but it's not for that reason that I say they overachieve. It is because no matter how many injuries they have consistently had this year, they just keep winning games, showing it's not just a few star players or a couple of things that keeps the boat going. It's the overachieving of even the smaller players that keeps this running. And it's really nice to see uh, for a team that's playoff bound because players will get injured in the playoffs. Yeah, and... And, I, you know, that's just... When you look at them, Sam, just, the, the it, other thing that makes them kind of an overachiever to me is just you look at the division they're in with St. Louis, Winnipeg, Dallas, Nashville... I mean, that right there makes this even more impressive. Yeah, it's a tough division. So with the, those injuries, it's not like they're in the Atlantic or something where it's easy. They, they're having hard challenges and still winning games without some of their best players at times. Yeah, and another team I would think would have to fall into that that's in a fairly tough division also with Washington, New York, and the Hurricanes would be the Pittsburgh Penguins. Yeah, absolutely. That's who I got at number one. They lost Sidney Crosby, proved they don't need him, probably in either the second or first hardest division in all of the NHL, and they're just pounding away, still winning. Now they're in a lower spot, but the fact that they're there at all is a surprise. Yeah, and when you look at those three teams, though, which one do you think is the biggest threat to possibly win the Stanley Cup? Uh, I'd probably have to go with the Islanders because – the Avalanche, as we just got done saying, are an incredibly difficult uh, division. And for their offense, all the other teams are defensive and goaltending based, so that's kind of their kryptonite is that division, although I would say they do have a chance. Uh, Excuse me. As for the Penguins, they're overachievers, yes, but I don't see them beating a Boston Bruins or a Washington Capitals just because they're going to be so outmatched. As for the Islanders, 
they've got some good pieces, and as long as they stay relatively healthy come playoff time, they can overachieve and beat almost any team you have there, including the Boston Bruins. Yeah, and I would think defense is what makes them the biggest threat here. Yeah, defense and goaltending, because Thomas Grice is outstanding. All right, let's go ahead and move on, and we are right around the Christmas break. Um, Who would be your leaders for the Hart Trophy? Ah, yes, the Hart Trophy. So I do have an, I do have one goaltender in this mix. He's not first on the list, but uh, as for number one, obviously you got to go Connor McDavid. He's leading the league in points, clearly one of the best players, if not the best player in all of the NHL, performing again absolutely fantastically this year for the Oilers yet again. All right, so anybody else? I know there's got to be a few more in there that aren't goalies. Yes. Uh, the second one would be uh, his partner, Leon Dreisaitl, also one point behind Connor McDavid. Very well done. As long as he can get a few more points, if he ends with more points than Connor McDavid, he could potentially get that award. As for number three, this is where uh, it gets a little interesting. He doesn't have as many points, but that's because of assists. The, uh, pardon me, lack of as many assists rather than goals. He's actually leading the league in goals, and that's David Pasternak for the Boston Bruins. He has 28 goals, and putting this in perspective, it's not like it's him and then there's a goal down and it's somebody else. The difference between him and the next person on the list is four goals. So he's doing quite well in um, in Boston and definitely deserves at least consideration for that. All right. Anybody else on your list that you think has a legitimate chance? Uh, if there was going to be one non-forward, it would be Darcy Kemper. Um, definitely the best goalie in the NHL right now. He did receive, or uh, he, I think he should receive the a Vezina Trophy. I know a goalie has received uh, recently, a few years back, um, the Hart Trophy before. So if there was one non-forward that was going to win it, I would say him. The other two I would have in consideration, but more unlikely would be, uh, oh, shoot would be Jack Eichel and Nathan McKinnon. All right, so this is my favorite time of the year, watching hockey, and that's because of the Winter Classic. And the Winter Classic has been, I think this is the 12th Winter Classic. This year is going to be played in Dallas, as they will host Nashville. And when I look at this game, I think that this was a brilliant move by the NHL 12 years ago to start playing this game on New Year's Day outside and I, I remember, I think it was the 2008 game in the snow with Buffalo and Pittsburgh. And I can tell you this, I'm a huge football fan, and I just watch mesmerized because of all the snow falling in the hockey game. And I, I think this is a game where you can actually kind of draw in maybe non-hockey fans or just part-time hockey fans. Well, yeah, because it brings back the origins of the sport. And the players talk about this a lot, too, is it's just fun to play outdoors because they're not used to it, and it's just the original experience. Well, plus you can get a crowd of seventy or 80,000 there, too, where they're used to a smaller arena with 20,000. Yeah, and that's where you can get uh, just more crowd noise than usual as well. Well, I don't know. I think it's maybe louder in an enclosed environment with 20,000 than it is outdoors with 80. But it's hard to top that crowd, especially when the game is played at places like Fenway Park, Wrigley Field. It's at Dallas at the old Cotton Bowl this year. And we talk a little bit Dallas and Nashville. And this is a game that I know it's early on, but this is a big game in the standings. Yeah, yeah, because... The Dallas Stars and Predators aren't too far apart. They're four points apart last time I looked. So if the Predators were to actually win this, and between now and then we're able to get a couple more wins, they could potentially actually pass the Stars in the standings. So not only would it be a big winner classic game and give you momentum, but you could also pass your opponent in the, uh, opponent in the process. Or the Stars could potentially pass the Jets again, in the standings by winning that game and gain momentum. It's a, it's a real big game on all spectrums. All right, and we also wanted to talk a little about Canadian teams. And it's been a little while, so to speak, since the Canadian team has won the Stanley Cup. And the last team to do it was the Montreal Canadiens in 1993, when I believe they beat Wayne Gretzky and the Kings in five games. 
and what do you think the reason for that is, and what team do you think has the best chance to break that streak? Uh, I think the reason it's been so long is two major reasons. First off, there are simply just a whole lot less Canadian teams. There are only seven. So out of a league of currently 31, more often than not, you're not going to win a Stanley Cup. But it's been a long enough drought that that cannot be the only explanation. And I think the other one is bad management. Um, A lot of the Canadian teams, like the Senators and Canadians, for instance, have terrible management which leads to no Stanley Cups. It just logically follows. But as for the teams that I think are most primed to break this, um, I think the first one I'd have to put on there, the most ready for a Stanley Cup, would have to be the Winnipeg Jets. Uh, Despite their division, despite the current lack of a lot of offense, they have an insane goalie, great defense, and they have potential for seriously good offense from their top players. So if there was any number one team I'd have to put there, it definitely has to be the Jets. Okay. Anybody else? Because I think Calgary should probably be in that conversation. They could. Um, I like the fact that they're going with uh, David Riddich now. I think that's what we said they should do last year. That's why they collapsed in the first round. Um, So Calgary could potentially, but I feel like they're – too many pieces away to be able to, although they could potentially win a round or two in the playoffs. Uh, if there was another team just because of mainly star power, I think I'd have to put the Edmonton Oilers, although I would say that's a little less likely. All right. So do you think that it is, it would be good for the NHL to have a Canadian team win it? Considering how long it's been and considering how big Um, hockey is to Canada it could be very good but I'm actually going to say it would be more beneficial to the NHL to have a American team win because that's where the NHL is growing right now is the U.S. so if you bring on another story like the Blues from last year you're going to continue to grow um, the interest in the NHL Um, but it would be good either way it would be more beneficial to the NHL period as an American team to win yeah I don't know though this is kind of you know, culture for Canada. And I don't know. Yeah, but it's not like Canadians are going to stop watching hockey. No, they're not going to stop watching hockey, but I don't know. It would kind of be like if Canada Canada all of a sudden had, you know, 15 Major League Baseball teams and the U.S. never got a team in the World Series again. Yeah, I mean, it would definitely be frustrating. But again, if you wanted actual, like, growth, the likelihood for that would be another U.S. team winning. It, I mean, it would be nice to see another Canadian team win since it's been so long, but for actual benefit to the NHL, it would be more beneficial in their growth anyway to have another U.S. team win. Um, I don't know. I, I would like to see an American team play a Canadian team. That would be interesting. It's been, oh, how many years has it been since that's happened? It's been a bit. When was the last time that happened? Well, I know the Canadians played the Kings. Um, the, Rangers, <laughs> the Rangers beat Vancouver in 1994. I'm sure it's happened a few other times in the last few years, and I don't know why I'm blacking out on that. But Oh, Vancouver played Boston. Yeah, that's right. In that was 2011. Years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's half a lifetime to go to use those, Sam. Uh, <laughs> not quite, not quite. Almost. But... I was just bringing up you're young and I'm old, so the show someday will be all yours, Sam. Ah, uh, too bad. <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, let's move on from the macabre. Uh, we know you do a top 16 power rankings every week, and real quick, you want to talk a little bit about you know, your top five for this week? Sure. Uh, it, it hasn't changed as the teams in the top five, but more where Reshuffled. they are in the top yeah. five. Yeah, it, it shuffled a bit coming over this past week. Uh, number five, I, I got to put the Carolina Hurricanes there again. All the same reasons. They're continuing to do good. Um, the only thing I'd like to see from them is 
for them to rise just a little bit in their standings in their division, but it wouldn't kill them to stay where they are. Okay. Who you got up for? Number four, I have, and this is the surprise, the Boston Bruins. They've dropped from one to two to four, and they've lost to a number of teams in the last stretch, and several teams have passed them. And this is very interesting. I wouldn't be concerned. This just happens in hockey. It's It flows. But, um, yes, they have had an interesting stretch recently. All right, number three. Number three, I have the New York Islanders uh, continuing to rise and now passing or passing the Boston Bruins. They're, again, we talked about this exceptionally good on defense and uh, goaltending. All they really need now is to get a little bit more on the forward end of things, and they should be good to go come playoff time as long as they can beat the Hurricanes. All right, number two, Sam. Number two. Again, rising in the standings are the St. Louis Blues, primed once again for a cup run. But the interesting part of this is that in their standings, they were very close with the Avalanche recently, but they've just passed them. It's a decent amount between them and the Avalanche now. So if they they can keep up this lead, they can almost guarantee themselves a uh, first-round spot or a, uh, pardon me, a number one spot in their division. Yeah, the Blues right now have 52 points. The Avalanche have 47, so they've got a five-point lead right now. So, yeah, that's two and a half games. Yeah. Um, Number one, Sam, (laughs) drumroll. Washington Capitals. It's not that much of, like, a drumroll if everybody knows who it is. I know. That's why I laughed when I said it. (laughs) Yeah, it's plainly obvious most wins most points it's not even close it's a few games and um points back from everybody um clearly doing the best nothing to be complaining about they're gonna get a first spot in their division um and as long as they don't screw it up like they have before and do what they did a couple years ago when they won the stanley cup they have a serious shot at doing that again and it would be interesting to see a st louis blues washington capitals I'm not sure if you saw opening day, but that was a good game when they played. Yeah. Um, all right. The Columbus Blue Jackets have won four straight. And you want me to ask you this question. And I want to know why you hate this man so much. But you want to know why or when John Tortorella should be fired. They've won four straight games, Sam. I'm aware. I'm aware. I was actually going to ask you this question. That's why the question mark was there. I should have made that more uh, specific. Yeah, but, but I want to know why the, there's if, even a – is there a question? Do you think he should be fired no matter what he does? No, but uh, as a head coach, you remember how we were talking about unprofessional conduct with the Stars coach not yeah. long ago. Yeah. It's very similar stuff. It's not to the extreme, I'm sure, as that coach. But as we've seen, he has a tendency to run his mouth. And as a coach, you shouldn't be doing that. You should be more professional than that, and especially after screwing the team over – for probably the next two to five years for one playoff series win and the whole trade thing with Anthony Duclair. I was curious what you thought about it. Should he be fired? And if so, when? I think this, if you haven't fired him, they're actually, they've won four straight games. It's hard to fire a guy when you're winning. No matter what the reason is, it's hard to do. Um, Dallas fired their guy, but at least they could say, hey, we're in fourth or fifth place. Now, I don't think anybody expected Columbus to be that great. He did win a playoff series, and you never know. Maybe the ownership is good with that. The Blue Jackets right now are 16 and 14, 38 points, but they're probably, just a guesstimate, probably seven or eight points out of a playoff spot, which is three or four games. But they are above 500. He did have a successful season, no matter what that was last year. I think you got to let this play out more. Um, because, number one, we don't know what the Dallas guy did, so that's hard to compare it. But we also know this. We live in a society where almost no matter what you do, if you're winning, you probably won't be fired. Now, to me, I think he should have been fired. I don't even know if he should have ever been hired because, to me, somebody who shows a lack of character in the end, you're usually not going to win with them anyways, so why not get somebody in with a little character that you can win with? But I would say the world is, the way the world is now, 
they're not going to find because he's won four straight games. Now, if they lose a bunch of games in a row and all of a sudden they're 15, 20 points out, then they're probably going to fire him. But as long as he's winning, he's probably safe. Well, they're currently 11 points out right now. Yeah. But what I'm saying is so that's not too straight. bad. And I, I understand what you're saying. It yeah, makes this sense. This is going to go one way or the other way. with him. You know, and my guess is at some point they're going to fall off the face of the earth when it comes to the playoffs. And when that happens, they'll fire him. Right now, it's just when you won four straight games, it's hard to ju- it's harder to justify firing him. And right. like I said, let's face it, most professional sports fans of their teams, if their team is winning, they don't really care what anybody's doing. I mean, we've seen guys that have beaten their wives who come back in a game for the first time in six months, and they get a standing ovation for it. So you got to kind of yeah. realize the world that we live in, or somebody will do something absolutely stupid, and those fans, as long as he's performing, will defend him and they will cheer for him, and it's wrong, but it's just the world we live in right now. Yeah, it's true. I was talking more about what you were thinking as to when to fire him, but I think you answered that too. No, that's it. I I, I never would have hired him. Probably would have hired him. With. <laughs> yeah. And I probably would have fired. I I don't know. You can't fire him after he wins your first playoff series ever. And it may just be they're waiting for the right time to fire him. It may be something. I think this. I think it's something that's already written in stone. It's gonna happen. They're just waiting for a good enough reason to justify it after last year winning a playoff series, and you know pushing Boston in the second round. Right, yeah, they've got to find a time for them to keep the fans from being upset. All right, Sam, best dark horse Stanley Cup candidate. Because mine's the Calgary Flames. That's why I kind of brought them up with the Canada thing. Yeah, they're my, they're my number two. I, I actually, as much as uh, it may be a surprise, especially with Sidney Crosby out, my number one is actually the Pittsburgh Penguins. Because they oh. lost their absolute best player, their goaltending is good enough to be able to have that potential with both Matt Murray and Tristan Jerry. Their defense, eh, but their offense is performing. So if they can put the pieces back together as before it comes playoff time and do what they did several years ago when they won back-to-back Stanley Cup, I, I don't see why they couldn't be a dark horse. Although I do agree with the Calgary Flames. They finally put – David Riddich in charge of the goaltending <laughs> instead of uh, Mike Smith by getting him away to Edmonton. And the funny part is those two might actually end up playing against each other in the playoffs. Yeah, but I like Calgary a little bit better because I don't like the Pittsburgh Penguins. Sam, you want to know why? Sidney Crosby? No, the Pittsburgh Steelers. Because I figure most Pittsburgh Penguin fans are Steelers fans, and I really don't like them. I don't, I don't like the Penguins because of Crosby, mostly. Yeah, well, I just don't like them because of the Pittsburgh Steelers. I have never liked them just because of that. <laughs> I didn't <laughs> like them when they had Mario Lemieux either in the late 80s, early 90s, just because of the Pittsburgh Steelers. I don't like anything from Pittsburgh, to tell you the truth, Sam. There's not a whole lot to like. No. Yeah. Well, how much stuff do you like out of Green Bay or Chicago? Not a lot, is there? No, and the... Blackhawks are worse, so, yeah, no. (laughs) There you go. All right, who will win? This is your question. Who will win the tank race for number one? I will make this claim. There may be front offices that try to tank for number one, but I don't think there's really coaches or players that do. No, no, but it definitely does come at the top from management. Yeah, but unless you're controlling what the coach does, and if you're controlling that anyways, that coach is eventually going to get fired anyway. The coaches on this list probably should be fired anyway, so <laughs> that <laughs> Yeah, but like the like Red that's Wings, not gonna it's not anyway. like there's a whole lot of talent there, right? No, it's basically one player. It's basically just Dylan Larkin. And it, the problem with the Red Wings is they have either – this. there are two types of players on the Red Wings really old, washed-up players who can't play the way they used to anymore or really young, inexperienced players who haven't found their good game yet and might never. Yeah, and the problem with that is those are the teams that end up on the bottom of this list for three or four years, 
And if they miss on draft picks, they stay there for a long time. Yeah, and that's the thing is they've got to hit it. Now, this is the good part, though, is Steve Eiserman is in management, and we saw him help make when Tampa Bay was good that juggernaut. So he does have the potential to turn a team from nothing to something. It's just whether it will happen with the Red Wings because they're so far down already. All right, Sam, anything else you want to talk about before we wrap it up? Um, I think that was good. I enjoyed it. All right, Sam, tell everybody where they can follow you on Twitter now that you know what your own Twitter handle is. <laughs> At Samuel McG22 for both Instagram and Twitter. Uh, I give updates for what we're doing in the future and how it's going. And please, if you have any suggestions for future articles or podcasts, I'm totally willing to hear them. All right, guys, so go follow Sam. You can follow me at Grueling Truth. Um, you can hear all of our shows anywhere you find podcasts, including iHeartRadio, iTunes, TuneIn, Spreaker, Stitcher, Spotify. So for Sam McGinnis, this has been Mike Goodpaster. You've been listening to The Grueling Truth, where the legends speak. <laughs>